right. Um, now that we are officially live, um, hi and welcome to the next webinar in our Plante webinar series. Uh, my name is Jason Padilla and I'm your technical host for today's webinar. Um, next slide. This webinar series is brought to you by Plante, the online, open online community for plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I would like to give a special, special thank you to all our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help make this webinar possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code percent then to receive 10% discount on your um, registration. ASPB members get early access to this webinar. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. Next slide. In addition, um, please be sure to check out our YouTube channel. Um, you, can, you, you can find a lot of exciting um, webinar talks um, that we've previously hosted, um, and there's plenty out there. Um, and as you know, this webinar will be made available to you guys as well, again, for viewing. Um, next slide. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items to make sure that you get most out of your attendance today. Um, if you are experiencing technical issues, uh, please let us know those um, using the chat box, or you can email me directly at jpadilla at ASPB.org. Um, if you have questions for our guest speakers, please add them to the Zoom Q&A section. Um, our moderators will be sharing them with our speakers. Um, if you have trouble connecting or need to leave the webinar early, as I mentioned, um, know that this webinar is recorded and will be made available, of course, on our YouTube channel. Um, so be sure to follow our Plante YouTube channel to receive notification when new content are posted. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to our moderators who will facilitate today's session. Take it away, Plante Fellow. Thank you, Jason. Um, thank you, ASPB, for this opportunity to organize this um, webinar. Hello and welcome to all for this webinar on shifting to new species or research subject. Whether you are a seasoned scientist looking to broaden your horizons or a curious explorer of the scientific realm, this webinar will provide you with a unique opportunity to learn from those who have transformed their scientific journeys in different stages of their careers. For this event today, we have three excellent speakers, Norma Perez-Rosas, Ari Fashroff, and Stacey Harmer, and they will share their invaluable insights and experiences with us all. This event will be moderated by three of us uh, Plante Fellows. I am Arpita Yadav. I'm a postdoc at University of Massachusetts uh, Amherst, United States. And I work on tobacco BY2 cells uh, as a model system to understand cellulose, microfibrils, and um, growth anisotropy, and which makes a lot of sense why I'm here for this webinar. Um, we also have Andrea and Rajashri uh, as other moderators. Next, next slide, please. So as an outline for this webinar, we will first have the introduction and welcome of the speakers and then the talk by each of them, followed by a Q&A um, session. With that, I will hand it off to my other Plante fellow colleague, Rajashri. Hello, everyone. I am Rajeshis Niyal, and I am doing PhD and uh, Dr. Ashish Ranjan at NIPGR India. So I work on plant developmental biology and photosynthesis. And today uh, is our first speaker, Professor Stacy Harmer, who is a professor of plant biology at UC Davis. And the, her lab focuses on plant circadian clock and they investigate their molecular basis and, and their effect on plant physiology. So their major work focuses around circadian clock light and growth signaling pathways. And uh, as you all know, she is a very recognized scientist in the field with the various prestigious awards and honors. So without any delay, I will hand over the stage to Stacy for sharing her slides. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, let's see if I can share. Yes. Hey, so uh, I'd like to thank Planty for giving me this chance to talk to you. 
about, um, it's a little bit of an unusual uh, experience for me talking about my scientific career. And just to, the, it unfolded in a somewhat winding way. As a graduate student and as an undergraduate, I worked on mammalian cells. And then during my postdoc, I switched to working on Arabidopsis. And now in my own lab, I've expanded to work on sunflower plants as well. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how these transitions happened and why I made them. Uh, so I earned a bachelor's degree in biochemistry as an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. And during that time, I wanted to know if I would, I thought I might like doing research. And so I decided to do a year's, year full-time long internship at a big company, Dow Chemical, working in an entomology lab. I did that between my sophomore and my junior years. And that was useful. I found out that I liked doing research. I also found out that I didn't really like working for a big company. So that was good to know. But um, it made me wonder if I might like working in an academic lab. And so when I went back to Berkeley, I worked in uh, the lab of Dan Koshlin, a, a biochemist, part-time as, as a student for a couple of years. And that was great. I learned that I did like working in an academic environment. And I got really interested in understanding this um, principle of signal transduction. So how cells take in information from the environment and then transfer that to changes in their cell fate. And that encouraged me to go ahead and apply to graduate programs. And I applied to programs I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in graduate school. So I applied to programs that had multiple faculty doing things I thought were interesting in the general area of signal transduction, which is of course pretty broad. So uh, I ended up going to UC San Francisco and I got in at the lab of Tony DeFranco where I worked on B cell antigen receptor signaling. And for those of you maybe not so familiar with this, of course, B cells are in the mammalian cells that make antibodies and B cells can present at the immunoglobulins that they produce on their cell surface. And when they sense the antigen that binds to that immunoglobulin, that can change their fate. So I worked on that during my thesis and uh, there were lots of pluses. I learned how to design a research project, really important. I learned lots of useful techniques. I learned things about um, reading papers, presenting seminars, all that stuff. I found I liked studying signaling, so that was all good. Uh, for me, there were some minuses. By the end of my thesis, I, I kind of was frustrated by the fact that my model system were mammalian immortal cells that were growing in tissue culture dishes and had been growing in dishes for decades. And so I could do cool things. It was, there was lots and lots of tools, but I was, always had this nagging question, what's the biological relevance of these things that I'm finding out? How does it relate to a real organism? And I was also a little bit frustrated because some of my friends in grad school were doing amazing genetics and I wanted to be able to do that. Um, and finally, my field of B cell signaling was essentially kind of playing catch up with the related field of T cell signaling. So T cell receptors are, you know, in a different cell type, but they have a similar structure and a similar signaling pathway to the B cell field. So at the time, at least, I felt like we were basically trying to see if what people had previously found in T cells was also true in B cells. And so that got a little frustrating for me. So I decided I wanted to do a postdoc and I knew that I wanted to change areas. And I spent a lot of months um, just trying to figure out what should I do next? And that was, um, in that process, I read literature quite widely. I knew I wanted to stay in biology. I ended up um, reading just papers that caught my eye. I watched a lot of seminars. Even at the time, there was a bit of a library at my university of pre-recorded seminars, so I could go back and watch those. Of course, now that's many more options to do that sort of thing. And I ended up, for my postdoc, applying to labs that I were studying things that I thought were interesting, dosage compensation, pathogen signaling, circadian clock, <clears throat> in a variety of model organisms, C. elegans, Drosophila, Arabidopsis. And uh, you might wonder how I ended up actually getting a postdoc in one of these labs, doing something very different from what I had done as a grad student. I found that I got the best responses from PIs when in my initial contact letter, I proposed specific projects that I might do in their labs. And this I wasn't entirely comfortable with because I was by no means an expert in any of these topics. 
but this was a way I found that people like took me seriously. And um, eventually I, I got some interviews and I became really fascinated by the circadian clock. And I was also really excited by the opportunities that were available working in Arabidopsis at that time. And so I ended up in Steve Kay's lab at the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, working in Arabidopsis. And there were lots and lots of pluses. Um, it was a time of great opportunities and challenges. This was at the beginning of the omics revolution. So we could, you know, this we could now begin to look at gene expression genome wide. At the time we did it with gene chips or microarrays. Also, the Arabidopsis genome was just being sequenced at that time. So that was a super exciting time in the field. And it was, uh, it turned out to be just a really fascinating problem at a pivotal time. We were, the field was just identifying the genes responsible for circadian clock in Arabidopsis and how those gene products interacted with each other. So that was, that was super. There were a few minuses. Um, and initially, at least, I went from being an expert on B cell signal, B cell signal transduction to a lab where I was a complete neophyte. I didn't know anything about plants. I didn't know anything about genetics. I didn't know anything about the circadian clock. I was frequently confused in group meetings and, um, you know, it, it was kind of tough. Uh, the experiments took longer than I was used to. So that took some adjustment. And I just didn't have the tools that were had been available in mammalian cells. So, um, you know, overall it was great. And I'm really glad that I made this transition, but it was not all smooth sailing. Uh, okay, so after my postdoc, I started my own lab at UC California Davis, and we worked on the Arabidopsis clock. And uh, we made an interesting observation that plants that that uh, are expressing firefly luciferase under the control of an auxin sensitive promoter serve circadian rhythms in luciferase activity. And you can see that this plant here is glowing with a with a 24 hour rhythm. And we could quantify this and you can see that from this plot that there's a 24 hour rhythm in uh, luciferase activity. And we went on to do some other experiments to indeed show that plant responsiveness to auxin was regulated by the circadian clock. And in fact, plant production of auxin was clock controlled as well. So this was cool. We were excited about it, but it also led us to wonder why. Why should you have a connection between this temporal pathway, the clock, and auxin signaling, which is largely involved in spatial regulation. And so um, I kind of mulled this over for a long time. And uh, I became fascinated by this movie, which is showing a sunflower plant that is still tracking the sun. So you probably saw it, it go from facing east to upright during the middle of the day. And as the day goes on, you'll see that it bends from, continues to bend towards the west. But then an amazing thing happens at night. This plant goes back to neutral and then it keeps on going. And so it's facing east before sunrise. So it seems to understand, it seems to know the direction and the timing of dawn. And this looked a lot like something that the circadian clock might be involved in. Oh, and I'll credit the movie comes from Plants in Motion. Um, you should check out that website. It's really great if you haven't seen it already. And so I wanted to start working on this problem and I wanted to work in the system of sunflowers, which were completely new for me. I mean, I, I started working with Arabidopsis in part because it was a plant that you could grow on a Petri plate. But now I wanted to work on this big plant that didn't have the same kind of genetic resources that Arabidopsis had. And so um, I did successfully make this transition and I did it by finding some great collaborators. Um, ben Blackman at Berkeley is one of them. And it allowed me to expand my lab's research to really look at how the clock and environmental cues are coordinating plant growth and development and what the effects are on plant fitness and on plant interactions with pollinating insects. And so that's taken my research into um, directions that I could not have imagined back when I was a graduate student. Okay, so if you're interested in making a transition, um, my first advice is, you know, we're, we're, I think we're all scientists because we love doing science. You know, we love understanding the natural world. So do not let yourself be bored. Um, seek out new challenges. I think I might not still be in science if I had stayed with B-cell signaling because I was kind of bored with it. 
So don't be afraid to make big, big transitions. What you've learned uh, up to this, whatever point you're at, you know, the scientific training you've had up till now, it's going to still be useful in a new area. But um, when you do make that transition, you are going to be ignorant. And so do not be afraid to ask questions that reveal your ignorance, because that's going to how you're going to learn. Um, so read broadly. Don't think you have to be an expert to suggest ideas. You know, part of the advantages of switching to a new system is you're going to have different ideas than people that are true experts. Make sure you find good colleagues and collaborators. That's always essential, but I think especially so when you're switching areas. Um, seek out appropriate training. This might be on the job. And expect to be uncomfortable because you are going to be putting yourself out of your comfort zone. That's, you know, kind of the point. And I think that's all. That's all I was going to say. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stacey, for sharing your insights. And I, I just uh, had one question, like, did you find any unexpected connections or parallels be between your previous work and the area of focus you are currently working in? That's a great question. Uh, I certainly, I think that my experience my, as a graduate student, where I did a lot of biochemistry and cell culture, I think it made me less reluctant to do kind of protein experiments in, in Arabidopsis. And that was an advantage for me because a lot of the people I was working with came from a more genetic background and they were, you know, that wasn't something that they would necessarily think about. In terms of the signaling pathways, um, not really actually, because I find that the plant circadian clock is just such a network um, it's rather different, at least from the way that we were thinking about mammalian signaling pathways when I was a graduate student. I mean, perhaps the field has changed a little bit at this point, but I had been used to thinking about things as linear processes, and now I, I think of them more as these just really complicated networks. Yeah, right. So there's one question from our attendees, uh, like changing to a new research subject is difficult at the beginning. So how long did you actually take to get used to the transition? Oh, um, yeah. So I would say maybe after about six months in my, in my postdoc lab, then I started to feel like I could open my mouth and I wouldn't necessarily be saying something ignorant. Right. And there's another question, like with reaching out to PIs with your own proposal ideas, how you have any advice on recognizing what's novel in fields that you don't have any experience with? Any advice on recognizing? Like what is novel? Like this field was totally new to you. So how did oh. you find what is novel there? Oh, yeah. I read, I was reading reviews. I was reading research articles and review articles before I wrote those letters. So I, I did invest a fair amount of time uh, in understanding these topics before I, I wrote any emails. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tessie. Now okay. I hand this over to Andrea or oh, to Arpita. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can uh, well to move with our next speaker. Arpita, please. Um so our next speaker is Arif Ashraf. Uh he is currently an assistant professor in biology department in Howard University, United States. He's a plant cell biologist and his lab in Howard utilizes Arabidopsis and mazes model systems to study nuclear envelope protein during movement and mitosis. During his postdoc uh, at UMass with Michel Fassette, he worked on polarized nuclear movement during asymmetric cell division. And during his graduate study in Japan at Abidur's lab, he started first working with polarized proteins and studied polarly localized transport of proteins during plant development and environmental response. He hosts Plant Biology Podcast, uh, No Time to Read, and he's also a co-founder of the Plant Postdocs community. Um, over to you, Arif. Uh, 
Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me properly and also see my screen. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I've, I'm Arif Ashraf. I'm actually a very new faculty in the biology department at Howard University. And first, I want to thank the ASPB. I am involved with the ASPB for a long time, and ASPB has a huge influence through their programs and their journal uh, to shape my career. I'm a plant cell biologist, so I'll give you some example how I'm related to, to this webinar topic and uh, walk you through over the time. So uh, before uh, going into this, to this topic, to shift into a new species or research subject, let, let's take a step back and think about what are the major points in our career we actually more prone or more prominent to shift to a new species or new research direction. So we go from like undergrad to the graduate school and then from the graduate student uh, to the postdoc and towards the independent position. What I observe over the times uh, to me and to my friends and the, their colleagues that actually most of the time this shift happens uh, when you convert from a PhD student position to the postdoc. And what I have seen through my career and to my friends, I want to actually split that into four uh, ways it can happen. So the one possibility is that, let's say you are working with the uh, Arabidopsis as a PhD student and work on stomata level of root development. And you wanted to continue on that direction when you go for a postdoc. And if that happens, both research species, plant species, and the research duration remain the same and you made that intentional choice, that's excellent. But let's face the reality that not always it happens. The first of all, we actually evolve as a human being, as a scientist over the time, and our idea is very dynamic. So we started to realize that maybe I want to change the research direction, or maybe I want to change the plant species I'm working with. And sometimes it is also the job market. I'm interested in a particular field, but the labs I'm interested, they don't have opening. So we have to make the adjustment to keep the life going on. Uh, so other things can happen that you remain in the same plant species, you are working with the Arabidopsis, for instance, and then you decide that, that okay, I have a certain amount of skill set, if I even uh, move to a lab, they don't work exactly the same field in Arabidopsis, uh, I'd be still very efficient uh, in doing all of these things. And for instance, if you're working on Arabidopsis, let's say lateral development, and in your postdoc, you move to Arabidopsis pollen development, you still can um, actually take advantage of all the skill sets you learn. And the second point is very beneficial from a recruiter's point of view. If I'm a recruiter, I'm hiring a postdoc, and I see that that person already has all this experience, I just know that I have to introduce him or her with a certain different tissue type. That's it. The third case can happen, you change the plant species, but keep the research direction same. So there is a big advantage of that. So that means like you already know all the literatures. You don't have to go back and start to the zero and start reading all of these things. Plus you know the people in the field very well. And uh, this one I call a good kind of switch and this actually happened to me. So I'll when I'll talk about my journey and my experience, I'll focus on this third one. The fourth one, it can happen that you change the plant or model species and also your research field. And it is definitely very, very challenging and it can be rewarding as well. So as I mentioned that the option three happened to me, I'll actually walk you to uh, very briefly about my career and what I learned and how I actually adapted with this app so far very successfully. So I want to call it a lesson from a polarized journey and you'll find out soon why I call it. And I often used to call me like polarized postdoc in many ways. So the one of the thing uh, as you have seen in the, some of the movies Stacey actually showed that the plant has a great intention to respond to the gravity or the light or the water. And all of these are very directional movement if you think about it. And those are very fascinating. If you go back like hundred years, you'll see the beautiful drawings of the Darwin's uh, a movement of the plants, but part of the movement of the plant groups. But at, actually all of this to happen at the cellular level. So the way we use the Google map to find the direction at the cellular level, uh, the compass is basically some proteins. They localize polarly, and that actually gives the direction to the plant to execute some uh, certain kind of activities. And we are very fortunate in a time we're living and doing the biology is because in the last couple of decades in the animal and plant system, we came to know about many of those beautiful polarized proteins. And I was very fortunate when I started my PhD in Japan, uh, I started working with some very known polarized protein in plant, like the pin transporters, oxygen transporter, and some um, ABC transporters. Those are also polarized. 
So uh, actually what happened, this polarized protein is not only give direction to the cell, but actually I got my first direction for my career from this polarized protein. And when I was actually a PhD student, I was working with as a model species like Arabidopsis. And as you know, like I can do everything in the chamber, in the lab. And then I just do all sorts of experiments, uh, which actually helped me to learn a lot of the different things. And the good thing about the Arabidopsis is that many experiments you can do in the crop plant, sometimes some of these things are limited. So I have a great experience uh, to work on the polarized protein using the Arabidopsis and model system. All of these things uh, was working great. And I was actually very much influenced by Arabidopsis. If you look at my uh, Twitter or X handle, it's called Arabidopsis. And even my blog is like ibidopsis.com. Uh, so eventually when it's time for me to graduate, like it actually kept me thinking that, okay, where I should go, what are the labs I should apply? And I, I was thinking the second option that I'll keep a stick with that between first and second option that working with ibidopsis because I know this system very well. Uh, I know all the molecular cellular techniques and stuff. So that will be very helpful for me. But something happened, um, I moved to US and I was in Michigan State for a couple of months. And that time I was actually working in a lab to work on corn. I was doing a lot of molecular biology on that lab. And it clicked in my mind that, okay, this system is super cool. Why don't I apply some lab, of course, the Arabidopsis, some lab with maize. And also I'll try to find a lab where I can keep uh, move to working on the maze, but also keep the research direction same. That is the first time it came to my mind. So I apply across the country, um, some very good lab for diabetes and some lab of the maze, and also include the polar protein. But from my heart, I was actually hoping that I can find that lab where I actually ended up uh, as a postdoc. And what was the great things that uh, the first thing everyone asked me over the times, okay, how did you adapt with the new model system, right? Like from the Arabidopsis to maize. And uh, very fundamentally, like when you work with the maize, you have to go to the field. That's a big difference between working in the Arabidopsis and maize. So uh, what actually happened, the time I moved to the US, uh, uh, it was actually middle of the summer, the field season is going on. So my I went there in July. So my first few months was basically actually in the field. Uh, I was just, just going, doing genitive infinity, doing basta painting, covered in the pollen and all the sweat. So what actually happened in the first three months, the difficult part or the challenging part, if I want to say the new components of this research is going to the field, right? So I went to all of that thing. But at the same time, the field season is done. I'm back to the lab. I'm trying to do all this other molecular and the cellular stuff. Um, here is the something like once I worked with the organism, Arabidopsis for four or five years, and then I moved to a new organism only a couple of months. So I was thinking that I don't feel that much connected, of course, compared to the Arabidopsis versus the maize. But here something happened interesting because I read a lot. Uh, as a PhD student, as a graduate student these days. So there was a book I read when I was a PhD student, when I used to work with Arabidopsis, like the feeling for Darwinism. And when I started my postdoc and going through all the fields and stuff, I reread that book. It's basically Barbara McClinton's uh, biography. And one of the things I want to summarize that helped me a lot uh, that I need to develop that feeling for my new organism. It's very philosophical, but it is actually so true that because you go to the lab, the first thing you see your that plant, you, you take a tissue sample from that plant. So you are basically spending a lot of time with the plants. So what happens over the time, I started to realize that, okay, after I isolate the DNA protein, whatever, it's basically the same. Once I put the, my tissue sample under the microscope, I just look at the cell, it's exactly the same. So things are very transferable. And over the time, I actually started to love it uh, because uh, I can do lots of cool and exciting timeless movies, something like that. So it combines my uh, interest for the cell polarity and also looking at all this, uh, capturing all these movies over the time. So that actually helped me to make a good transition um, to the new model system or organism. And uh, it, so far it was very rewarding, I should say. And there is a big advantage of switching um, keeping the research situation same and go to the different model system. Uh, I'll just give an example like here. So for instance, I was working on some polarized protein, some cell division in the maize or corn. But this cellular feature is basically very common if you look at Arabidopsis, physical or some other asymptotic cell division in uh, zygotic division. 
So what is actually pressed me to think about the bigger question, what I'm actually doing, how is a important question in biology is for the eukaryotes, for multicellular organisms. So oftentimes I refer to this as like a presidential debate. Like you put into that stage, so you're pressed to think that what is the bigger picture you are going to do? What is the bigger picture you're going to draw? And it actually helped me, I want to say, when I think about go and talk with the federal grant agencies, go and talk and give a talk for the job. Uh, the, immediately, because in the department, not everyone knows that you failed, right? So you have to connect them in the level of the biology. So that was actually very helpful and rewarding. And uh, before I'm going to stop, um, in the Q&A, you can ask me questions, but I actually want to give you a question to, at the end of my uh, session, that we often then talk about model organism, non-model organism, traditional organism. And over the time, we basically, when you think about a model organism like E. coli, E. Stereopsis, C. elegans, fruit flies, mouse, if we think very deeply and fundamentally, why these model organisms are even model organisms? The reason is that most of them actually sequence very early compared to the other organism. They have many genetic resources available, including mutant and transgenics. So now if we think about that, if those are the criteria, having the genome sequence and annotated and have the enough genetic resources, anything can be model organism now. The reason is that we can do the sequencing way cheaper, way faster. We can do the mutation or the whatever, uh, the, the gene we want to knock out, we have the CRISPR. If we want to express a protein to the cell biology, you can do wh whatever combination you want to do with the golden gate and all sort of things. Only maybe sometimes you feel some challenges in the transformation and that can be also tweaked with some technical things. So my point is that we are living in a very interesting time of uh, doing the bio as a biologist, that any organism should not be categorized as model and non-model organism. We need to think and press ourselves about the questions, how the biology can be progressed, how my discovery is going to actually fundamentally change the textbook. And oftentimes, like this semester, when I'm a new faculty, go to the class, I give the examples and find the whole textbook is actually so skewed with some of the organism. So I hope like the, as a new generation of biologists, we'll be more focused on the questions and the biology, how we can progress rather than stick ourselves with the model organism. So with this, I want to end here. If you have a question, please go ahead and ask me. Uh, thank you, Arif. Um, thank you for leaving us with that thoughtful uh, slide. So one question that I have is, um, how about the productivity in terms of publication when you switch from a model organism which has been studied for a while and uh, switching to a you know crop species uh, like you have switched to maize does the productivity change oh my god this is the question if you don't ask me so the thing is that uh, the arbidopsis we can grow in a couple of weeks we can go to generation to generation faster in terms of the corn uh, it takes way longer so many people told me, okay, it will take you time to get things done and all of these things. Uh, but one of the things, first, uh, let me put the number, right? So I usually in the biology do need to do a, quite a longer postdoc, but I did postdoc less than four years. Not only that, in that meantime, I published first author papers just using the maze, not touching arbidopsis. And so it is just the planning, right? And new skill sets, how you combine all of these things. So for instance, yes, the maize will take time uh, or some other species may take time because of the technicalities or the, how the life span works. But the thing is that uh, it's, it's a lot depends on your planning, right? So, and also like when you go to the journal, there is a tendency, let's say the reviewer, if, if they see the whole experiments is done in abdopsis, they can actually demand more for you to perform, right? But if it is done in such a difficult organism and it is well known that it takes time, no one will suggest to experiment that will take two generation, uh, you know, go to the two summer. So there are like, uh, there are way you can actually go through that. And in terms of productivity, I'd say like, if you're productive uh, working with arbidopsis, uh, nothing should stop you and there should be anything stand between you and getting things done uh, if you plan well and if you use your skill set properly. 
uh, thank you for answering that. So we have a question from one of our attendees. How does sequencing a new organism make it a model when there's not the decades of physiological or cellular research done on it before, as there are with example, Arabidopsis, Drosophila, C. elegans, etc.? So I, I call it the amplification effect. So for example, let's say today I took it, uh, I'll give you an example of one model, uh, one or two. Like for example, like Marcantia or Fiscometrila. Like when I was a PhD student, there was not many lab working on that thing, uh, only few. But what actually happened that how much resources I'm creating. So for instance, you just give me one organism today and you give me resource, right? And I create all the basic resource and then the community starts following, right? The 10 labs followed me, right? On that organism, or they adapted it. Over the time, it actually amplifies. Why you work on the arabidopsis? It's very easy to order those mutants, right? Why we use the arabidopsis? Because it's very easy to transform conflict the maze. So what actually happens once you, you take any XYZ organisms, make the well annotated genome, create the transformation efficient, and you will see people will just jump into that. And of course, like any organism, when you look at, we see that in evolutionary context, they have a huge influence, right? So unless we have these resources, although we have questions, we don't jump into that because it's kind of risky to work on those things. And uh, one of the things, like if we look at uh, last five years paper, the papers, even the any development paper, any cell biology paper, previously five, 10 years back, it was just, okay, I took an arabidopsis gene, just crack it down, whole pathway. But now, if you look at it, the top tier journal, if you show a mechanism, uh, you actually need to show it a multiple organism. And the reason it is happening because you have more resources getting available. So the, the barrier between model and non-model organism, in my opinion, is getting very thin. And at some point it will disappear. And that is what I'm looking for as a biologist in the future. Thank you, Arif. I think we have Time for one more question, probably. Um, why can't we develop such technology in crop plants to increase the transformation efficiency and lesser the growth stage? Yeah, so about the crop, I think that one of the major issue right now is that the, the transformation efficiency. So for example, most of those crops, uh, except rice, I think rice is very easy to transform. Many labs are doing it. Uh, I, I can tell for maize. So maize is mostly done by some transformation center. And uh, yeah, if you go to a lab, a uh, well-established maize lab and say that, oh, I want to transform maize, probably they'll say, okay, don't waste your time because there are some starting challenges, right? So. Uh, one of the things I would say um, as the, it kind of is the previous question about the productivity, to know very clearly what can be done, right? What you can do clearly get done. And some area, maybe you can just do some fishing expedition. Okay, it can work, it cannot work. But don't uh, let that fishing expedition or all of these fancy ideas occupy your whole mind. Then, uh, then it will actually hold you back it will actually affect your productivity. So if you think that, okay, I can outsource this work, the first thing you should do, get the money, outsource that work. Don't keep more things on your plate. Okay, thanks, Arif. Um, now I will hand it off to uh, Andrea for our third speaker. Yeah, thank you so much, Arpita. Can you hear me well? <laughs> Yes. Um, so now I'm really happy, I'm really honored to introduce uh, Norma Perez Rosas. She's uh, currently a postdoc in the Purdue University in USA. And she holds a biomedical engineering and physics uh, from the Center for the Research and Advances uh, from Mexico. And uh, Norma's field, uh, her research is a uh, development of mathematical models of complex biological systems focused on the application of nonlinear dynamics to cell signaling, calcium signaling, and physiology. And her own outstanding contribution have uh, garnered a prestigious accolades such as uh, granted by the Mexican National Council for Science and Technology and the European Calcium Society. Uh, currently, 
and she leads the research on calcium imaging and techniques in the embryo institute. So thank you so much, uh, Norma, to stay with us today. So oh, okay, <laughs> thank you uh, for the invitation. Can you hear me? To share, so... yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you see my presentation? Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, okay thank you. So, um, yeah, so to, today uh, I will talk about my, my journey in the, this area of calcium signaling and computational models. So, uh, first of all, a little bit about introduction uh, about me. So, I am a bionics engineering uh, graduated by, uh, from the Instituto Politico Internacional from Mexico. I had a P uh, master's degree and a PhD in biomedical engineering and physics. Uh, in in um, during that time, um, I started uh, learning about uh, calcium, and uh, and then I did a postdoc in the group of Dr. Lacuma at uh, Bayoquan Heidelberg University, and currently I am a postdoc in, in the group of Dr. Uh, David Umulis and uh, Adrian Boganza uh, at Purdue, and I also work uh, in in the Embryo Institute and. Uh, uh, so far, as I said, since, since the master's, I, I start my journey in the area of systems biology. And since the PhD, um, yeah, I, I am working on, on calcium signaling and um, I, I develop computational models to understand uh, this ion. So towards the slide, I, I will explain uh, the, this, uh, these years of work, working in this area. So my life, my, my life as an engineer, basically what I did after uh, I got my bachelor's degree, is um I basically uh recovered or record these signals from the muscles and I stimulate the muscles based on this signal, but uh it, it, that the I mean by that time my my profile was purely like engineering, and uh, and then when I was in in in, in the masters uh, I um was introduced to this book which is called What's Life, uh, this book was uh, uh wrote by uh, Erwin Joringer. So basically, uh, this book uh, uh, presents a series of lectures that uh, Joringer gave um, by by, um, by the 40 years, you know, uh, several years ago, and he was just like uh, saying, like, uh, if we can use physics or or chemistry, you know, to explain uh, biological processes which are uh, really complex. So he he actually let's say challenged the community particularly physicists, you know, to, to really to, to explain the biology. Uh, because by, by that time, several laws uh, from, from physics and chemistry uh, were already, um, how to say, were, were really validated. But, but for the biology, I mean, um, several open questions, uh, I mean, re remain open until today, right? So, so I really became involved or interested in this book. And actually, this book and an experiment that, that I saw uh, when, when I was uh, starting my PhD really uh, attracted me to, to the calcium area. So in, in the group of uh, Dr. Agustin Guerrero in uh, Simestad, Mexico, he, he was uh, doing this kind of experiment. So basically what you are looking here is a cardiac cell. And he, he added some uh, indicator inside the cell. So this, this indicator uh, catch calcium let's say, and, and when this, or, or interacts with calcium, and when this reaction happens, it basically um, you, you can track that interaction via the fluorescence of, of the cell. So, so uh, simulating the, the cardiac cells, uh, you, you can see these uh, calcium waves in, in, inside the cell, in the cytosol. So, as I said, uh, previously during, the, in the, during my bachelor's and after the graduation, I basically work uh, uh, studying muscles, but at, let's say, at microscopic level. Uh, but but once I saw this, this kind of experiments, you know, like uh, that we have this uh, particular calcium activity inside the cells that really catch my mind. Because, uh, I mean, for me, it was like how all these fluxes, cal oh, cal uh, calcium fluxes happens inside the cell and that uh, at the very end uh, modifies the cell behavior. So, so, so then I, I really, became involved in this area. So, so basically what I have to say now is that 
most of the biological processes that happens in 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 the organisms uh, are um, calcium is involved. So so for example, in our body, uh, uh, in our skeleton, uh, we have around uh, one point. Uh, five kilograms of calcium and around 10% manages to escape from the skeleton and it circulates in, in the bloodstream and penetrates the cell. And once calcium is, uh, is uh, calcium penetrates the cell, inside the cell can interact with uh, several proteins and uh, the interaction modifies the, 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 um, the structure of the proteins. And in this way, calcium uh, trigger uh, several uh, signaling pathways. So, which kind of signal pathway? So here, I I am just like showing some some examples. So so here, uh, you can see an sperm. A calcium indicator was added, and uh, and you can see, let's say, the the blue color means uh, low calcium concentration, and yellow and red color means high calcium concentration. So. In this case, you can see, let's say, the basal, the basal behavior of the sperm. But after some stimulus, you can see how calcium really uh, modifies the cell behavior. In this case, you can see the stimulus there, and you can see how the, the frequency of this movement uh, increase. So, so also, for example, here, what you are looking is uh, after egg fertilization, in the egg, uh, calcium wave uh, appears immediately after, you know, uh, and at the very end, the effect of this uh, calcium wave is that uh, that, that avoids the polyspermy. So you, you have already uh, uh, watched this uh, video regarding uh, the, the cardiac cells. So all these experiments, for example, happens in, in single cell. But you can see, for example, in, in Venus flight tribe, uh, when uh, a stimulus is, is applied uh, to this uh, hair in, in the plant, you, you can see how the stimulus triggers a, a calcium wave. In this case, the plant is expressing some uh, uh, calcium indicator. So, so that you, you can see how uh, that stimulus modifies the same behavior and, 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 and the messenger to modify uh, completely the behavior here is, is calcium. So, so I really became interested in this area, uh, and so far I can spend several uh, of, of my days working on this. So, so basically, what what I do is, uh, you know, uh, I, I have the the, the experimental uh, the the biological system, you know, and once I have the biological system, what what I do is I have to to build a mental diagram about all the molecular players that are interacting with calcium in that particular uh, uh, system, and then uh, after after that I, I have to do some assumptions. That, that means uh, depends on the number of particles. If I have thousands of particles in my system or few particles, I have to use different mathematical tools because the idea here is uh, uh, the, the calcium activity is quite complex. So uh, since, since the very beginning of that, that this area uh, started uh, growing, let's say, or, or when when was really confirmed that calcium modifies or affects uh, several biological processes, I mean, together with experiments, uh, basically, the scientific community also uh, started like uh, proposing uh, computational models to, to in in order to help to explain that that calcium activity. So basically, basically, this is the workflow that that uh, we basically um, follow, right? Uh, to 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 build these uh, computational models. So we we uh, do some assumptions, and then uh, the idea is to propose some dynamical model that represents how these uh, the, the molecular players uh, uh, behaves towards the time, for example. And then uh, we have to solve this model using computational tools, and also we have to analyze the, the model, right? And one of the most important processes here is to, to validate our proposal. And at the very end, uh, we have to share our models with the scientific community. So uh, uh, during the PhD, for example, my, the first uh, problem that I solved was a kind of counterintuitive uh, problem because uh, what you are looking here is a, a calcium activity in the cytosol and in the reticulum. The reticulum is a network that is spread all over the cytosol. And uh, basically the, the reticulum stores calcium. So applying caffeine um, opens the calcium rich channels located in the membrane of, of the reticulum and calcium basically uh, is, re is being uh, released from the reticulum and increases in the cytosol. 
So here you can see how uh, calcium com uh, come back to, to the basal level and another pulse of calcium was applied. And we observe a, a, a totally or, or completely an opposite or yeah, a, a, let's say transient or behavior compared to the first case. So, so this um, this problem is not like an easy problem because we assume that all these reactions are happening in the equilibrium. So uh, we can discuss that later if we if you are interested. But, but the idea then is to propose a mathematical model to explain these behaviors. So this is basically what I do. I do the abstractions, you know, and I propose a set of reactions and fluxes. And, and for example, using numerical optimization and so on, I can uh, try to, you know, solve or estimate the parameter values that fit uh, the, the temporal courses in this case, uh, uh, the calcium in the cytosol and the calcium in the reticulum. So for example, using the normal uh, way to model calcium, uh, I couldn't explain this counterintuitive behavior. So, so I, in, during my PhD, uh, I proposed uh, a new competition, a, a new framework about how to understand the calcium activity, about uh, how uh, the, the reticulins is actually binding calcium. Uh, I call that, that proposal kinetics on demand. So, so basically, uh, the idea here is that uh, once calcium uh, enters the reticulum, uh, uh, polymerize calcium polymerize the proteins and that actually allows me to explain these these particular traces uh, that were observed in the experiments so so these um i mean this this model wa were, were, was validated and as i said we published and and we made our computational model available towards biomodels database and then uh, during my first postdoc in the group of dr ursula kuma in, in heidelberg i um I started a, a study uh, the how the uh, homeostasis of calcium is uh, keeping in the transgordi network because here in it is in this compartment uh, the the sorting of proteins happens so there are uh, sorting processes that are really depend that 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 depends on calcium so basically I I came out with a computational model to explain that that sorting process but also during the time that I was with her, I actually underst uh, I understood how calcium works as a messenger, how calcium actually uh, affects cell behavior. So for example, you can see here uh, some signal, a signaling pathway, you know, uh, in this case, uh, you can see here some receptor uh, and, and agonins can, can bind this, this receptor and signaling pathway is uh, starts uh, at the very end we have the synthesis of this molecule that is called IP3. Uh, and IP3 uh, opens some calcium UV channels that are located in, in, in the membrane of the reticulum. And that induces uh, the release of calcium from, from the reticulum. Uh, calcium is highly toxic, toxic then cell invest energy to remove calcium from, from the cytosol. So, so basically, this let's say this is a signaling pathway that we know that is working, for example, in hepatocytes. But happens that if um, we change the stimulus, for example, here in this case, phenylephrine was applied, and in this case, ATP was applied, and you can observe how the the I mean the calcium activity is totally different, just changing the stimulus. The stimulus. So, so basically, uh, what happens is that. Imagine here is a phenylephrine or ATP. So the, the depends on the on the stimulus. These all these proteins uh, encode particular calcium pattern, and then all the enzymes uh, or or proteins that can bind calcium decode that calcium activity. So so in this way, actually, uh, the the communication uh, or, or how the how the cell knows uh, what what. Uh, Basically, I mean, what, what, uh, which molecule uh, touch the membrane, you know, interacts with the receptor is towards these calcium patterns. So, so the idea here is, uh, or uh, during the time that I was working with her, I actually un understood that that these calcium waves uh, were also like some communication systems that probably we are familiar with that with with this kind of communication system, right? We know that that for for radio. Uh, the, the wave can be uh, modulated via the amplitude or via the frequency. So the cell is doing exa exactly uh, the same. So the idea then from my side 
is to design the, the computational models, you know, in order to explain this calcium activity. So here, th these are the experimental results, and here you can see the results from, 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 our, from the model. And in this case, this model was uh, published by Dr. Kuma. But this is basically the area that I work, you know. So, so and at the very end, uh, the idea is once we have the, the computational model, then we can test uh, different scenarios that are not like easily to, to do experimentally. So, so in this case, for example, we, we observe that there are, a, there are a particular set of parameters that actually, uh, I mean, we don't have these gentle transients anymore. Uh, and this kind of, of, of uh, transients now, uh, if we uh, study the relation of calcium in the reticulum against the calcium in the cytosol, we can see how actually the behavior is completely chaotic. So, so in this way, we can approach these biological systems, you know, and and um, and at the very end, uh, what what really catch my attention is that uh, this uh, normal spiking, let's say, uh, is a signal for the cell to continue surviving. But but there are some transients that are actually high, uh, and and the duration of the transients are like for several minutes and so on, uh, and that determines or that is a signal uh, for the cell to, to to die, right? So calcium actually determines the destiny of the cell. So so we as a computational mo uh, modelers, uh, we actually have to propose the models to explain th these kind of behaviors. So currently, I am a postdoc at Embryo Institute. So, so here uh, the institute uh, has the, the aim of um, of uh, to, to explain the rules of life, and because calcium is really involved in the destiny of the cell, right? We, we are interested to to study several biological systems and to see if there are like common rules between them. So, so so far, for example, in the institute uh, we study uh, wind disk. So the wind disc is this organ that at the very end produces the, the wind of the flight. And, and happens that uh, increasing a particular stimulus for the wind disc that triggers different uh, calcium patterns. And, and at the very end, modifying these calcium patterns, for example, affecting the pump that, that refills the reticulum with calcium, for example, has an impact in the morphology. So, so, so then, what I could say at this point is that calcium can be involved in calcium in, in uh, muscle contraction, uh, fertilization, uh, proliferation, cell death, but also uh, towards experiments that are being uh, conducted in, 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 for, for the groups that belong uh, to the embryo institute. We can see that, uh, that actually calcium is really involved in the morphology. So you, you can see the effect, as I said, just affecting uh, one of the pumps, but also, oh, sorry, um, for example, here, uh, another uh, area inside the Embryo Institute is uh, we study the zebra fish development. So, so let's say uh, 30 minutes after egg fertilization, uh, the animal starts, starts growing from this pole. Uh, basically, the first cell starts here and then uh, this cell is split and so on, and at the very end, we finish with the animal. So you can see here, for example, the top view of this stage, when, right after, let's say, we have one cell and the cell will divide in two cells. So, so here, what you are looking is the top view of, of, this, uh, of this cell, and, and you can see a particular calcium pattern, and the calcium activity actually determines the cell division. So, so here you can see calcium increases in this area, and that splits the cell. Uh, and again, increasing all the area and that speeds the cell and so on. So inside the Institute, we, we are interested to study not just only uh, how calcium is in code and decode, but actually uh, how all these reactions are coupled with the mechanical deformations. So, uh, so I, I, at the very end, one of our biggest question is that if it's possible to understand how the interaction of molecule, uh, molecular components inside cells induce the properties of light at system level. So, so here, one of the questions that I think we have to answer during this talk is what I consider crucial for, for switching to a new research project. Well, I was just doing some research, let's say uh, several websites uh, refer to, to all these, uh, let's say, uh, um, 
how to say, I mean, listed all these uh, crucial components, right? But, but for me, one of the most important thing is the personal motivation. So in my case, it has really catch my mind and, and I really <laughs> pursue that, you know, I, I started working with uh, muscle cells, but at this point, knowing that calcium is involved in almost every biological process, then, then I, I move between uh, biological systems, you're thinking like calcium really determines the destiny of the cell. So also, um, what kind of challenges we are facing inside the Embryo Institute? Uh, so, so basically, uh, handle this kind of projects means we really have to work with several collaborators. We have to integrate several data, right? We also face a, a technical problems. For example, uh, the calcium indicators that have been developed so far, let's say, uh, are well established, but but the ex the experimental setup to track simultaneously the the calcium activity together with the mechanical deformation that is actually a challenge, right? Uh, the the biological systems are really complex, right? Uh, also, you know, in, in this case, uh, the Embryo Institute is a multidisciplinary and inter uh, multi-institutional <laughs> institute. So, so uh, we have uh, five uh, universities from the U.S. that belong to the Embryo Institute. So actually, uh, that also is a challenge, right? Because so far, several of the collaborators uh, are, are not like based in Purdue. Uh, they are, for example, in Puerto Rico or Texas and so on, right? So also literature integration. So, so we have to review a. Uh, you know, uh, in order to, to, to know uh, common properties uh, for life, we have to, integ to integrate what is what appears in, uh, in um, or what has been reported for several biological systems, right? And, uh, and also, uh, so some of the things that, that to towards this, this time that, that the Embryo Institute, uh, I mean, has been open is like, uh, or, or since the time that was funded, uh, uh, for example, people that come from 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 very experimental area, it's a little bit challenged, you know, to to move or to develop skills about how to implement a computational model, how to solve a computational model, and I think the most difficult part is how to integrate all this in uh, in to produce geometries uh, that can be deformed based on their reactions. So um, yeah, uh, regarding this area, what advice I, I can do for someone that can work in this area? is uh, every time that you start with new system, go deep into the, the, the biology, try to understand the system as much as you could. And also it's very important that you work, you work together with experimentalists to, to really know the, the species. Uh, we have to discuss regularly and openly our projects. And obviously once we uh, solve the computational model, uh, we have to validate the model. So if something uh, doesn't look like like the experiment, right? We have to to go back and to to review the literature and also to discuss again and to do the abstraction again and to start proposing the reactions again, right? In order to to see if we we are missing something uh, or 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 the current knowledge is not enough to explain what we are uh, observing in the experiments. So so far, this is my last question to to live or to live. Uh, basically, that's the role that's the role of calcium calcium determines the destiny of, of the cell, and that's all from my side. Thank you so much, Norma, for your talk. So we are really appreciate your time. So I think we don't have any, any more time for questions. So, yeah, I think that's a... Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe we can go and worry about the, the webinar now. So, yeah, thank you so much to all our speakers. It was really great and really nice to hear uh, your advices and your experience about switching uh, to new species. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Norma, Arif, Arpita, Rahashi, Jason. Uh, so, I think that's all. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us again. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy um, today's webinar um, and we hope to see you guys on the next one. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. Bye.
Bye. Happy Thanksgiving.